Hello, Brokettes, and welcome to episode number 170 of the Reasons I'm Broke podcast. I'm Daniel. And I'm Kelly. Kelly and I bring you the reasons we're broke every single week, ranging from comics, movies, TV, video games, and more. This week, we have a whole list of things that make us broke, but how we format the show to let you know all those things is first we start out with some news. Again, this ranges from comics, movies, TV, video games, groceries, power bill, water bill. (laughs) Radiator. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. All the things that make us broke. And we follow up with just a few of the comics that we read through the week that we want to highlight. Many podcasts take a break during the holiday season, during... December, there's these previous two weeks that many podcasts said, hey, we'll see you in 2016, enjoy. And a lot of listeners out there I've seen on Twitter don't have podcasts to listen to, especially with their fancy new iDevices or Android phones and tablets that they just received, and they want to subscribe to new podcasts. So if you're one of the new broquettes out there that is tuning in for the first time on episode 170, Thank you so much for your consideration, for tuning in, and for listening. We hope you enjoy the show. We do hope, even for the existing brokeheads, that we make the workday or drive to work, drive home, whatever it is you may do while you listen to the Reasons I'm Broke podcast a little bit easier for you every single week. While they're pooping. While they're pooping, too. (laughs) So we're going to start off with some great news, a lot of hot topic news. I hear about this thing all day long at work. I'm sure all of you brokettes do also. But we want to highlight some of the amazing Star Wars The Force Awakens records that have been broken. Disney has made a shit ton of money on this. And we knew they were going to. Current estimates have it at 120 $0.5 million in just the opening day. That's insane. This breaks the previous record holder, which is Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows Part 2, which made $91 million. So it very it beat it by a good amount. You mean Harry Potter and Snape being dreamy part two? <laughs> I think he was dreamy in part one. He was That's dreamy. That's when he learned everything. All of the Harry <laughs> Potter <laughs> movies. When everyone learned that Snape was the hero in the Harry Potter books. Harry Potter and Snape really isn't that bad, huh? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So it's currently going after the current highest grossing record holder, which was Avatar, at $2.78 billion. I don't remember. Look, I know Avatar was huge. Mm-hmm. I know a lot of people were talking about it, and it was a huge contender for making 3D the new standard for films. Did not end up ha- happening, thankfully, because yes. people like me who have fucked up eye genetics and astigmatism <laughs> i'm like i don't see this 3d thing i just see two blurry images it doesn't work for me the tipic- ticket prices are a lot higher than your typical mm-hmm. already expensive movie prices so i did not want 3d you don't like 3d either and you have no. perfect 2020 vision i do i got the great genetics in this <laughs> relationship but see what's going to happen is you're going to get lasik someday and then you'll see 3d even better than i do like, 3D will actually touch you, and then <laughs> you'll want to go see 3D all the time. Well, in that case, I'm glad that they shut down the Michael Jackson ride at Epcot. Cause, uh... <laughs> Every time we'd go, you go, ooh! <laughs> so, yes, neither of us are a big fan of 3D, but there is something to be said for 3D, because as we can see with both of these movies, it makes them a shit ton of money. Many people give credit to Avatar's current record with the fact that, again, 3D tickets Mm -hmm. were a lot more expensive back then. And I I had a lot of friends that were telling me, you have to see Avatar, but in 3D, otherwise you won't get the full experience. And that always rubbed me the wrong way, because a movie should always be good regardless of what medium you see it in. It should tell a good story. And that's why you have classics like City Lights that are in black and white, standard definition. You won't see that bitch in high def. And it will still give you tears at the very end of it because it is great and it will eclipse several of today's movies. That was still before they were even speaking in movies, right? It's a silent movie. So there you go. Black and white, silent movie is still amazing. (laughs) No color, no sound, just music and Charlie Chaplin's fucking face. (laughs) (laughs) And some words. And a great story. So that's what, what Avatar made a lot of its money from. And at this point, I don't know if Star Wars The Force Awakens uh, will beat that box office. With the holiday season, with Christmas, many families are going out. They're taking their kids. Mm-hmm. By the way, I heard a story 
that a lot of parents were taking their kids, right? They grew mm -hmm. up on Star Wars. They want them to see The Force Awakens and to fall in love with Star Wars because this is the new Star Wars for right. future the generations. And that's great. But they <laughs> they played the Deadpool trailer before Star Wars The Force Awakens where he drop, drops two F-bombs <laughs> and there's like a bear a fucking woman in a thong ass. <laughs> a thong ass. <laughs> Right there on the big screen in front of all the kids. <laughs> Good for those kids. Was so, this a mistake or was this in like every theater? It's a marketing thing oh, okay. because they Fox pays X amount of dollars to play this trailer before the Star Wars movie. I, right. I'm not sure who they pay. I'm sure it's Disney. And you saw Warner Brothers did the same thing. They played a Batman v Superman trailer. Disney included mm -hmm. their Captain America 3. And then Deadpool with its rated R trailer in front of all the kids in this PG-13 movie. How, how did it end up with a rated R trailer? Don't trailers have to be suitable for all audiences? From what I heard, and a lot of pissed off parents, was that there were some curse words dropped during this, this actual trailer. And uh, I've, I've, I remember seeing the trailer even when we were when we went to the movie theater. He did drop like shit or fuck. I don't remember which one of those two, but I don't know. It, just, it was a pretty rare. They're <laughs> normal trailer. words to me now. So. And it may be to audiences, and maybe that's what the marketing team mm -hmm. was thinking. But there it was a Deadpool trailer and and heads being blown off on top of that. <laughs> awesome. Sounds like a good time. <laughs> so uh, that just reminded me of it. <laughs> a lot of pissed off parents. I think this definitely has the potential to beat Avatar's records. Like you said, it's a holiday, so a lot of people are going. But even beyond that, I've yet to talk to a person about this movie who hasn't said, I can't wait to go see it again. I'm going to go see it again. Just need a day off. My day off is in this many days, and then I'm going, oh, I don't come into work till this time. I'm going to go see it before work. And like I said, that's been everybody who's seen the movie thus far. Mm -hmm. So, yes, Avatar got a lot of hype. But I didn't hear it talked about as well or as frequently as this movie. And with multiple viewings on Christmas Day, hey, you have to check out the new Star Wars. Let's all go see it. You haven't seen it yet? Yeah, let's go see it. That's more ticket sales mm -hmm. that are going in there. People seeing it twice, three times. We're recording this on Christmas night. And there were, you can bet that the theaters were packed with people. I'm sure a lot of listeners out there right now went and saw Star Wars on Christmas Day, Christmas night. And thoroughly enjoyed it. Or maybe they showed it to someone else. It's been a pretty big hit for Disney. Regardless of what criticism you may have about the story or even I may have about the movie, it's Disney is definitely banking on Star Wars. They're, they, this is, <laughs> they're easily making their money back very right. quickly on what they spent on Star Wars to buy. Merchandising alone is huge for this film. And with the holidays also, we actually had a story we wanted to share <laughs> <laughs> with this holiday rush, with this holiday mm -hmm. hype and anger, and with <laughs> returns happening very soon. We had a little interaction with a uh, lady at Joanne's. Yes, so this was December 23rd, because I am a slacker and I wait until the last moment to buy my gifts. Tisk tisk. I'm sorry, I try not to. I'm much better this year than I was last year, you have to admit that. You're getting there. I'm, I'm slowly, slowly but surely. So Dan and I are standing in line at Joanne's waiting. There's two cashiers open and the woman in front of us, and she's the next person in line. Who hadn't been waiting more than five minutes. No, not very point. long. So this next person in line woman standing there with her basket of things. <laughs> and You're she like goes, her basket of shit. <laughs> yeah, it was. It was fucking cut fabric to make a quilt or some shit. Anyway, she goes, ugh, two days before Christmas and they only have two registers open. Who does that? <laughs> yeah, she turned back to us as if we were going to be like, I yeah, know, two. I know. What's going open on? more. Why? They should open more. They really should. <laughs> Customers always know more than the actual people that work at these places of every course. fucking day. Of course. So <laughs> I, being a good citizen, bit my tongue before I said something. I did not. Yep. <laughs> and I applaud you for what you did say to her. All I said to this lady was, I work in retail and it could be a number of things that only has them having two registers open, probably short-staffed. And her response was, oh, like people calling in because they don't want to work? <laughs> she... <laughs> Let that sink in for a minute on Broquettes. <laughs> it's pretty unbelievable. I, I, What did I say to her again? You were just witnessing yes. this, this disagreement between two people. Yes. And I said, well... It's that time of year. 
That's exactly what I said to her. I said, it's that time of year. And then you two stared at each other. <laughs> yeah, she looked right at my, my fucking eyeballs, <laughs> and I stared right back. And I kept, I'm like, I'm not going to break this now. This is on. Mm. This is now a contest. Whoever blinks and looks away loses this little argument of, you started this bullshit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and she fucking blinked and turned around and did not say another fucking word to word. us. She just waited patiently. She knew I was not going to agree with this fucking woman and mm -hmm. I was ready to argue and I did. <laughs> what were you going to say? I mean, you bit your tongue. What would you have said? I, I, I would have said something along the same lines, but not as eloquently. So, for Brokettes who don't know, Dan and I have the privilege of working in the service industry in two very different departments. So, that's awesome because we understand everybody. Uh, Dan works retail, I work food service. So, this time of year when I hear people say those things, I get so angry because I am those people. I am the person trying to cover being short-staffed. I'm the person working on Christmas so you can have your cheeseburger. You know, you're the person working Christmas Eve when you could be home with your family. Mm -hmm. Thankfully, you get to be off on the holidays, which is awesome. But that hasn't always been the case, right. you know, every year. So we really feel for these people. And when I hear something like that, I, Facebook reminded me, what was it, last year, two years ago? I had had an encounter at Starbucks. I was waiting for my coffee. And, of course, they were understaffed. There was one and a half people working I think is <laughs> what I put and some lady comes storming in going I was in the drive through and my drink's wrong and some of the lady goes well I was here first they need to make mine first and then she turns to me and goes well you were here before all of us and I said yeah and clearly they're understaffed they'll get my drink when they get to it it's just coffee shut both those ladies <laughs> <up>. <laughs> But I, it just, it's frustrating that people don't think that way. Like, it has to be them, 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 and them, their schedule. It's like, mm -hmm. you know, look at the people working in the stores, working in the restaurants. I have coworkers who are working 70 hours this week. 70 hours so people can have a cheeseburger while they're rushing around trying to spend time with their families. And I, I can't tell you how many people I talk to today who are upset because they can't spend time with their family. You know, their family's in another state or they're working 12 hours today. Mm -hmm. And then you have assholes like this lady who just complain because things aren't catered to them. Fucking lady at Joann's, if you're listening to this, <laughs> welcome to the podcast. We appreciate the we listen appreciate and the download. Listening. Thank you very much. But your, your fucking ass waited till December 23rd to buy your bullshit. Mm -hmm. Expect lines everywhere you go. And right, it doesn't even apply because it's it's before Christmas. Even after Christmas, right. brokettes out there, there will be lines of exchanges gift cards being used, returns, returns without receipts, which already cause a mm -hmm. longer delay. Expect that shit. Well, these stores should just prepare for that. You can't prepare every year for that fucking rush. It's it's impossible. You'd have to mm -hmm. open up the store to a size that would be impractical for the rest of the year, having all those registers. There's a lot of background to this. And then regardless, too, people hire employees just for the holiday season. They right, come in seasonal work. and they, they start working the end of November and they only work until the middle of January. So they're not experts at all this stuff. They are still learning the register. They are still learning stuff in the stores. And then you're going to sit there and complain that it's taking too long. Like they're trying. Just be glad they have a body there. Well, Kelly, they should put the more experienced people on register. Right? Okay, so you the want other... them to work seven days a week, open to close? Like, I just, I, I wait for the day when someone comes to me and says, oh, you have to work on Christmas? And I go, you're in my restaurant, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> and I would, I, I'm thankful that you spoke to that woman because you said the same things I would have, but I would have had a tone. And we're both women, so she would have read into that tone. And it would have escalated from there. At least you're a man. I just joked about it on Facebook, and I was like, she was upset, and then she looked into my eyes and went, oh, who's who's this man? Oh, I guess I can wait here a little longer. If it means looking at but, you a little. But then the, the thing that, the thing that like flabbergasted me even more... The, and we've talked about this for a long time because this is this is my nerd rage. Mm -hmm. <laughs> is she had cuts of fabric in her basket. So if they had had another register open, that meant the person who cut her fabric 
wouldn't have been there. And then right. she would have gone, oh, well, they only have one person cutting fabric two days before Christmas. <laughs> Later, let's just hire someone to help you out whenever you're in the store. Right. And, and they could just follow you they'll around. They'll follow you. We'll, we'll pay their salary just for them to follow so you. Can you. Buy, you can spend your $10 right. on whatever. <laughs> so two days. And, and when you use your coupon, they can cut out the coupon for you, like here. I had my own little rage a little bit, actually tonight. Yeah? With, you remember Shane Davis, right? Yes. The Red Lantern guy, yeah. created Dexter. talked Deck about Star. him, what, two episodes ago? Two episodes ago. Tune into that broadcast if you want to see the full details, but the gist of it is he created Dexter, who was the Red Lantern cat, mm -hmm. and he he gave Art Baltazar and Franco, who are two comic book creators, more famously known for Tiny Titans, but they do all kinds of stuff. And he went after them because they created a Tiny Titans version of Dexter, which was then published into a or created into a plush and he, he was upset because he didn't get one or or he wasn't getting royalties off of it and he called them unoriginal because they should come up with something new instead of just redoing old characters he was upset about nothing and today i, I noticed on twitter this morning that he was bitching because dc hadn't sent him his deck star plush and i'm like you know what fuck this i'm gonna fucking tweet this guy because this does not make any sense so I told him, I thought you didn't want them to be merchandising, and you're asking DC, where's your Dexstar plush? And the next tweet after that that I sent him was, that is the impression I got from all of the whining you did mm -hmm. to Franco and Art Baltazar. <laughs> and <laughs> I didn't get a direct response. He did not tweet right to me, but his timeline later on tonight was, look, the Dexstar thing isn't that big a deal. Yeah. I got my package from DC, it was just sent to the wrong apartment, and inside was a Dexstar plush. So I guess he is cool Get with his Dexstar being created into a, He fucking just flip-flop, changed his mind, is suddenly not upset about it. Just fucking... What, what do you want, Shane? <laughs> what the fuck do you uh. want? And so I just had to call him out on it because the hard time he gave Art and Franco to the point where Art just had to block him because he just kept tweeting and tweeting at him and insulting his work... You don't deserve respect, Shane Davis. I'm sorry. It's like when you order a pizza and you tell your friend what's on that pizza. And they're like, well, then I'm just not going to eat any pizza. But then the pizza gets there and they're like, mm, I guess I'll eat pizza. <laughs> well, it's the only thing here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's exactly what he did. <laughs> yep, yep, pretty much. <laughs> pizza face Shane Davis. That's what it all comes down to. <laughs> so back out of the rabbit hole that we just jumped into <laughs> for a very long it, time. Yeah. Uh, to remind Brokats, we were still talking about Star Wars <laughs> mm -hmm. and making lots of money. And it has made a lot of money. However, in a different market, Star Wars The Force Awakens was not the number one movie at the box office. That's right. What region, what country was it? Japan. Japan. What movie could have eclipsed Star Wars? What movie is greater than Disney's Star Wars? Not Pokemon. Not Pokemon. You're right. It is not Pokemon. Yokai watched <laughs> the movie too. <laughs> <laughs> Yokai Watch outsold Star Wars. So this not Pokemon thing <laughs> sold nine hundred seventy five thousand tickets on Saturday and Sunday. So in two days, almost a million tickets. <laughs> yeah. That's crazy for not Pokemon. For not Pokemon. For not Pokemon. <laughs> for Pokemon impersonators trying to be the next Pokemon, but it ain't gonna do it. Sold almost a million tickets. I'm waiting for that shit to blow up here. It's not going to. Just so that I can sell nope. the graphic novels to customers. And it's another thing we can sell to people. Nope. I, whatever, I want everything to do well. Nope. So I can sell it all <laughs> is what I want. <laughs> I am the president of the Don't Let Not Pokemon Be the Next Pokemon fan club. Pokemon's and beaten Digimon. I'm starting a movement. It's gone through Yu-Gi-Oh. Okay. It's gone through Beyblade. Okay. It'll be fine. Pokemon will go through Yokai Watch. Um, yeah, because Yokai Watch is never gonna get its start. Pikachu's gonna like <laughs> dead. <laughs> so even though Yokai Watch sold way more tickets than mm -hmm. Star Wars, why did Star Wars make more money in Japan than Yokai Watch, than not Pokemon? Because not Pokemon sold mostly to dumb kids. <laughs> <laughs> not dumb kids. Who They're didn't just know any better. <laughs> and their tickets are cheaper. That's right. Children's tickets were cheaper, so in the end, Disney ended up making more money than, I don't know, who makes Yoka, who That's put out Yokai Pokemon, Watch, the movie, but they so. still made a shit ton of money of regardless course. and sold way more tickets. Still blows my mind. I think that's an amazing fact. 
And it's, people are like, well, it's just Japan. Well, they still sold a shit ton of Star Wars. Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> Which well, one did you want to see do better? Star Wars or Yokai Watch? Did you have no preference at all? Not not Pokemon. So, yeah, Star Wars. <laughs> but that's not Pokemon either. So, not Pokemon is trying to be a Pokemon impersonator. And I don't approve. <laughs> They're doing some weird thing. with Now, see, and it's a confusing title because it's called the Yokai Watch because he uses a watch. To catch the yokai. Right. But it'd be better if it was yokai watch, like you're just like creeping on the yokai and watching them. <laughs> to catch a yokai? Yes. <laughs> and then Chris Hansen has to come out. <laughs> what are you doing? Why are you looking at these yokais? <laughs> <laughs> Here in this manuscript, it said he wanted to block his plane. <laughs> <laughs> and you asked the yokai what panty colors they're wearing. <laughs> Have a seat right here. <laughs> I want it to be like that little ghost guy, too, that they use for the advertisements. <laughs> you brought over some beer. <laughs> <laughs> what was that for? <laughs> oh, I love to catch a predator. Never gets old. Never. So the biggest thing was the movie theater side. Star Wars continues mm-hmm. to rule all. Let's head on over to the small screen. Warner Brothers has announced that CW is bringing DC's Vixen over to the live action platform. So she will appear in the Arrow TV show, who's pulling a lot of people. So I'm wondering if he's not doing real well. <laughs> <laughs> no, Arrow does get really good ratings. I don't know if they get Flash ratings, but it's still a very solid show for the CW. Megalyn Echikunwo, I'm sorry, Echikunwoke is her name. <gasps> Somebody tripped you up. Somebody finally Somebody tripped finally you. Somebody finally got me, yeah. This is, this is... <laughs> I don't, I can't function right now. This has never happened before. <laughs> you would have missed so, it too. I'm so excited. Well, that's why I let you say it because I would have been like Megan Ichikana Lakahachi. <laughs> that's what it looks like to me. Well, Megalyn will reprise her role as Vixen. She previously portrayed the Vixen on the web series for CW Seed. Vixen first appeared in Action Comics number 521, which released July 1981, and was created by Jerry Conway and Bob Oxner. Yeah, a little background on Vixen in case any speculators <laughs> wanted to find that book that they're going to become millionaires on. So Vixen's powers include connecting with the Red, which we first read about in Swamp Thing mm-hmm. with the New 52. And she uses the the red to draw upon the abilities of any animal that has ever lived on the planet. Cool. Because Vixen's connection to the red is so deep, she can even use multiple abilities at once. That's awesome. Could she call like upon like disease cells? She could. It's a living thing. I mean, that's what I would do to everybody. Be like disease. <laughs> you will die in seven years. <laughs> is that what you would do? Yeah, I'd be like. <laughs> gingivitis <laughs> or, like people i didn't like when i was working a regular job gingivitis now what <laughs> herpes <laughs> <laughs> and then what else could i do like food poisoning could you do that i don't well i mean yeah bacteria is involved you salmonella right okay, in there yeah done. salmonella right in your face Although, now you're fucking dead well hold on it's it's her abilities to she copies the abilities of any living thing so the ability of salmonella it's not to poison thing. It's just that we eat it and you become sick. So you, they'd have to consume some part of you to become sick. So that would not work out. I would be a cheetah and then get the weight of a blue whale and just run into people <laughs> at full speed, full cheetah okay, speed. Okay, but that doesn't mean you don't get obliterate hurt. Obliterate them. Okay, you're the weight of a blue whale. Yeah. But you're not, like, made out of metal. But, but if I'm the weight of a blue whale, yeah. then... Wouldn't all my skin and everything also be weighed down, hence also become a little bit tougher and be able to go through? Yes, so you weigh more, but if you go to a blue whale and you stab it with a knife, you still stab the blue whale. So if you're (laughs) running into somebody and they have a blue knife or a gun, it's still going to hurt you. Fine, but good luck stabbing or, or shooting a blue whale coming at you at the speed of a cheetah. All I have to do is hold out the knife and you're going to run right into it. That's all I have to do. Your logic is flawed. <laughs> Your logic is Well, anyway, so that's flawed. what I would have picked. What, so you would have picked disease, amoebas. And <laughs> yeah, because then I could do real shitty things to people. Fine, I'll think of something else, like a bird so I can fly. Or, I don't know. Reminds me of Animorphs a lot. Mm-hmm. So Vixen will make her live-action debut on February 24th episode of Arrow. Hopefully she's using diseases. <laughs> 
So some way cooler DC news, actually on the video game side. In an interview with Rocksteady Games director Sefton Hill, it was revealed that there will be more for Batman from the studio itself coming beyond 2016. So we're going to speculate on what content or what possible new game Mm -hmm. that they may be bringing to the Arkham series. But to anyone that did not see where exactly this came from, there was an interview officially with Rocksteady and they were more or less promoting the new DLC that just released, which Maceo at Mace the Murderer on Twitter wanted to know what we thought about it. And I did download it and I did finish 75% of it because I did leave one villain till the very end and I will touch up on that. But when he was asked about the future of Batman and if they were done with Batman on the Arkham series, Sefton Hill just responded with, well, and then it cut into like a quick image of Scarecrow and then the interview kind of fast forward into something else. So that is, is Rocksteady's always done very creative things with the Arkham series and letting us know what is coming up, even if it's DLC or even future games. They did it with Arkham City and they did it with Arkham Knight too. Are these guys your friends? They're not my friends. Because they're probably trolling us. <laughs> they're not trolling us. They they have a good track record of of coming through on their promises on anything they tease as well. Well, this is then the perfect time to not live up to that promise and just troll people for years. <laughs> I put up a, an innocent little comment on YouTube saying, I'm really glad Rocksteady is not finished with the Arkham games and that we're going to see more from them in the future. Hopefully, Paul Dini writes the next one. That's all I said on YouTube. Someone immediately jumped on me and said, they never said anything about a new game. They, they just hinted at some future content. It could be DLC for all we know. They never once confirmed that it's going to be a future game or anything. They immediately jumped on me. I'm like, Jesus Christ, mm-hmm. dude. All I said is I'm happy that they're coming up with something new. So I just rewrote my exact original post, reposted it under a reply under his right at him and just added or DLC at the end and mm-hmm. in the middle of the whole thing. And it's just he's like, mm. <laughs> in all seriousness, I definitely think that there will be new DLC. I would love to see a new game. I This sounds weird. I would love to see Batman Beyond game. A lot of people are asking about that. They want to see Batman Beyond because they're saying, okay, and it's spoiler alert, but the game's been out for several months now. Bruce Wayne is long, no longer Batman. Mm-hmm. That's where the game ends up at. So people are saying, hey, let's see Batman Beyond. But you're not going to have Batman Beyond without old man Bruce. Of and we course. already know that the new successor to Batman takes over almost immediately, right after Batman goes away, retires, whatever it may be. And there's someone you who seems to be using the Scarecrow Toxin. That's the same effect that they Mm -hmm. had when you see the extended ending after you get 100%. So I don't think it'll be Batman Beyond, especially after the skin rocks that he gave us. They don't really know the Batman Beyond outfit. But it doesn't necessarily have to be in the same continuity if you're going to release a Batman Beyond game. I think there's a lot of... I would love to see it in Neo-Gotham way in the future. I think that there's a lot of creativity that they could pull into that. But then you could also have Old Man Bruce, and maybe there's DLC where you fight with Old Man Bruce, and then you could do, like, double takedowns and switching up, and I'm like, whoa, Old Man Bruce. That would be awesome, and there are a lot of questions that they left at the end, and a huge criticism on Mm -hmm. gamers' part, mine as well, because it wasn't a complete ending like it was in the previous two Arkham games. So hopefully this DLC answers a lot of that and gives us way more, if not a future Arkham game, whatever it may be. I'm still 100% convinced that Suicide Squad, the standalone game, is coming based on the way Arkham Origins ended. So that obviously won't be done by Rocksteady. It'll be, it'll be uh, WB Montreal. But just the fact that Rocksteady said, we've got more stuff coming for you guys, even if it's not a full game, or maybe it will be. Who knows how many more zeros WB put on that check. Right. There's more coming. So you did say that we needed to touch up on what our thoughts were of the DLC that you just played. Yeah, that's the most wanted DLC that included four brand new villains, four new missions in Gotham, which were the Mad Hatter, Mr. Freeze, Ra's al Ghul, and Killer Croc. And I, of course, left Ra's al Ghul to the very end. You saw me complete the other ones. Mm -hmm. So let's give our impressions, our reviews. Is this the DLC people have been waiting for that they're saying, okay, now the season pass is worth it. The three that I saw you play, I enjoyed them. I think Kevin's delivery as Batman was a little off in some points, particularly with Mr. Freeze. They put a lot of heart into that story. And then at the very end, he just kind of dropped the ball with the line that he said. I was like, oh, 
Yeah, Kevin Conroy couldn't have gotten a second read on that. Like, I know he's an expensive guy, but <laughs> we're not going to see them again. <laughs> he says it like that. And we know Batman, the animated series Batman, was super sympathetic to Mr. Mm-hmm. Freeze. Even the Arkham Universe Batman was very, very soft on Freeze, as we saw in Arkham City. That one being said, or all that being said, that one was my favorite of the three that we saw. Mad Hatter was really cool, though. They did a, a weird, loopy thing at the end. Yeah, it's kind of like the Scarecrow's Fear toxin, but with right. Mad Hatter, like right. they did in Arkham City mm-hmm. also. I enjoyed that. And then, I don't think I saw all of Croc. I came in, in and out when you were playing that one. I felt really bad for Croc, and I think part of that is because I loved him in the animated series. And I viewed him as such a sympathetic character like no he just needs love but that's not necessarily who they portrayed him as in this game but in this they still made him into a victim with the dlc which Mm -hmm. was very smart of them so going back in the mr freeze one i do and i'm sorry broquettes i am going to spoil the story to the mr freeze dlc but i do want to really talk about it and for this one this is this is why i want to talk about it's the first time that they do a mr freeze story there's only one of two endings you can do with, with the Batman the Animated Series Freeze, the one that we all love, not Mr. Zero. And that is that he's trying to save Nora, she's sick, and he freezes her until he can find the cure. And he needs money to find that cure, and he's got these people that started all of this and turned them into who he is, who he wants to get revenge on. Mm-hmm. In the Animated Series, he goes after what people love because they take Nora away from him. In the Batman the Animated Series comic book, Nora wakes up and says, you're a monster, and fucking leaves. We've explored almost every possible ending to Mr. Freeze. It's hard to give him an ending because it's 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 such a character that is doing the right thing but has to go to extreme measures right. to get there because it is for love and adoration for Nora. In this DLC, they say, okay, this is the only other ending that they haven't <laughs> ever done. And that is that Nora wakes up and she says, Victor, I just want to sp- spend the last couple of days that I have left with you. And I understand what you've become, and I want that to stop. Because you've you've gone through all of this because of me. People have gotten hurt, and I don't want that anymore. I just want to live and die, and that's it. And it's just, you're sitting here watching this like, holy shit. Paul Dini didn't write this, and it's amazing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> what do you think of it? I agree. It was amazing. Like I said in the beginning, very, very heartfelt. And that's what you want from Mr. Freeze. You know, in this, he's he's working... With Batman as opposed to against him, which was a wonderful twist, mm-hmm. uh, you know, very realistic. Uh, the All the parts with Nora were great, a, a very understanding and accepting woman. And again, you feel bad for her because you understand what all she went through, even though he's trying to save her. And then he has that dilemma of, do I give her what she wants or do I keep fighting knowing that we'll have more time if I do? And it, it's a hard choice. I don't... You know, when you sit there and you think about it, I don't know that I could make that decision either. Freeze could have easily gone against her wishes and said, no, I'm going to freeze you and Mm -hmm. I'm going to fucking cure you. Because if his heart were that big or his compat, I don't know what you would call that, that part of Freeze were that much, he would have just done it and Mm -hmm. frozen her again and and just, you'll forgive me later. Like some line like that. Right. As he has his hand over her, maybe like a tear that turns into a snowflake, whatever it may be. Would have been great too, but what is your your ideal Mr. Freeze ending? Is it the one where Nora leaves after she finds out what a monster he no. is? Is it the one where she wants to live out the rest of her days with him, even if it's just a couple? Or is it where he's forever searching for the cure for Nora? I like the ending where she wants to live out her days with him, even if it's just a few. I feel that it's very realistic. If I were in her situation, that's what I would want. Uh, she explains in this, and again, spoiler, sorry guys... That even when she's frozen, it's like she's in a dream. She can hear everything. She, She's aware to some degree that she's just frozen. And that would be difficult. And I don't think that's a situation that I would want to live in either. There's also the Ty Templeton expanded comic book ending where, yeah, she leaves Mr. Freeze after she finds out who he is, but comes back to him after like a slight misunderstanding on on his criminal like past or whatever Mm -hmm. and she says no i'm gonna find him and i'm i'm going to work things out with him and this is after she's already cured 
and she sets off on this journey to just try to find Victor again. And I thought that was also a really, yeah. really nice ending because you, you just think, okay, she'll find them eventually and he'll be happy because he, he gets to live with Nora even though he's forever damaged physically. That does mm -hmm. not matter because Nora's okay. Stop. <laughs> so, so, yeah, the DLC. Is it worth it for the season pass after this? We all know everything beforehand was... <laughs> what do you think? I think it was worth it, but I didn't pay for the season pass. <laughs> you're right. I did. <laughs> but, okay, so if you're as big of a Batman fan as we are, yes, all of this is worth it mm -hmm. because you're getting a lot out of it. But if you're looking at this as, okay, how many more hours am I going to get Am I gonna get out of it? Am I going to get, what was it, $40 for the DLC? Maybe mm -hmm. a little bit more? Y this last bit of DLC is maybe an hour and a half. Yeah. It's not super long. Each of the character missions are maybe 30 minutes, mm -hmm. a little bit less. So for that, especially if you've done the Arkham games and you're pretty good at them, a lot of these challenges are not going to be that big of a deal. But just to see if you enjoy the story and you want to see more of the Arkham universe and the Arkham villains, then yeah, I'd say definitely check it out. But Regardless, there's going to be a Game of the Year edition eventually, something that'll include the season pass. Mm -hmm. So if you're not as big on it, just wait for that. So those were our thoughts on the DLC. If you guys picked it up as well, let us know what you thought on Twitter, at Reasons I'm Broke. Tell if you liked it, if you hated it, if it was worth it, if it wasn't, or maybe what DLC you would like to see if the rumors are true and they are bringing out something. And if we do the Rachel Ghoul portion which we will do but if it's something really compelling just like the mr freeze one was we'll cover it next week on episode number 171 do you think every rachel ghoul thing is compelling <laughs> because he's the best he's my favorite batman the rachel ghoul dc dlc could be him stepping out going hello detective and then stepping away again and that's it and you get a trophy completed <laughs> and then you would be worth it Worth the, that was awesome. worth the entire thing. There he was. Especially if he came out shirtless and holding a sword. Because <laughs> Batman and him, they have to cross swords and, and then fight. he just stepped away. Even <laughs> if that was it, you'd be like, worth it? And then the rest of the time you just had to fight random thugs. Not thugs. They're members of the League of Assassins. No, I'm talking like thugs. Not even the League of Assassins. <laughs> like the only thing you get is you're fighting all these thugs and then you round a corner and he just like steps out and he's like, yo. And then he steps. He could even say yo, which isn't even a race thing. And then step <laughs> away. And you would say, hmm, yeah, it was good. I, I liked it. Mm, very good. <laughs> very well-rounded story. Mm, yeah. <laughs> all right. So now we're going into the one bit of news with actually with comics and mm -hmm. it all pertains to dc and then we're going to hit into some bestsellers so with close sources on dc with bleeding cool and cbr there are rumors that dc will be publishing some of their regular series on a bi-weekly basis the reasons were broke the reasons dc should not be doing this <laughs> agreed so previous bi-weekly and weekly titles in the past have included brightest day Countdown, and the current Batman and Robin Eternal. Okay, so we know why they're doing this. They're losing market share mm -hmm. to Marvel and, more importantly, to indie books. They're actually growing more than ever. And I think a lot of that is a response from readers who want good stories, who want good art. They just want good comics. They don't want any gimmicks. They don't want over-publishing like Marvel's doing. They don't want uh, weekly books like DC is starting to embrace. And with the image in, in Boom Studios and Valiant, they're all just like, hey, we've got stories that we're focusing on here, character-driven stories. Come by and pick these up. And there's no 3D gimmicks. There's no variant month themes or any of that. And this is why they're losing it. Both companies are not focusing on having solid stories. Instead, they're just on Disney side, on Marvel. They're just publish everything, see what sticks, overpublish it, no returns on any of it done they they don't care <laughs> you yeah. know and on the dc side they're like whoa what can we do next let's try this this thing and, and and dcu oh shit that failed so get back to batman and superman which you were happy about but now let's try to do bi-weekly and double publish them no one's looking at the stories and trying to tell their talent hey guys make the next blackest night make the next secret wars mm -hmm. do that instead and I, I don't know i think it's a huge mistake on dc's part i yes Yes, it is. 
bi-weeklies for us are very frustrating because it's already difficult enough to find the money to buy these books once a month. Mm -hmm. And now you're saying we have to buy it twice a month? That is terrible. <laughs> the only thing I would buy bi-weekly is Saga. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you would. And Saga should be bi-weekly. Anyway, so yes, definitely dropping the ball on this one. And I wish that they would look at their stories, just like you said, and start encouraging their people, make this better. Make this similar to this. Let's see what we can do. Let's see how far we can take this. And, you know, I, I don't know where that disconnect is, and I wish that I could figure out mm -hmm. where that disconnect is. It, it almost feels like the people high up who are making these calls don't have a love for comics. Or they're at least out of touch mm -hmm. with the current market, with what readers want. More recently, and I'll, I'll tell you straight up, because I work at a comic shop, and I can l let you know that the Robin War thing, with the return of the Court of Owls, should have been much bigger than what it ended up being. And I think what killed it was, one, they did not make it clear enough as to which series they needed everyone needed to pick up to read all of Robin War. Enough with this crossover shit. Put your event in one book just like you did with Dark Side War, which mm -hmm. is doing great and it's telling a really good story. Do that with Robin War. Put it in Damien Son of Batman. Put it in We Are Robin. Whatever ch one of those books you want to choose, choose one. Stick with it. Don't make readers well now, oh, let me try to get Gotham Academy and I think this one ties into that. I'm not sure. Because there's no checklist out there even in marketing that you guys give to comic shops that we can say, look, if you want to read Robin War, these are the ones you need. And yeah, they're inside the comic book but when you have something physical or when you had, no one wants to, once again, go through and try to track down well, this came out this week now. People don't go to comic shops every single week. Your average reader does not. I'm sorry. And when you're putting out a, a big event that is going to be, you have to go every single week and try to pick up these books, it's not going to work. And this is why bi-weekly books mm -hmm. are not going to work in the long term. They're going to sell more copies of books, but they're going to lose readers. They're going to do that to less readers. And readers will very quickly drop any one of DC books because they don't have the pull that Marvel does or Image does to say, you know what, let's put out a bi-weekly Spider-Man or a bi-weekly all-new Wolverine like they did when they first did the new number ones recently. Mm -hmm. They can do that because Marvel does not have to return shit. They don't have to take returns. They're the top dog right now. DC does not have that. Don't pull this stuff with Batman. I don't care if Batman's the top seller every single month, even if it were. Don't do that with Batman. Don't do that with Harley Quinn. Continue streamlining and cultivating those stories and then the readers will come truer words have never been spoken <laughs> <laughs> guru dan <laughs> <laughs> she, she did a little bow just yes. now <laughs> emperor papa kelly approved yes that's huge you've been, you've been papa approved <laughs> <laughs> that is fucking huge from papa kelly <laughs> yes emperor papa kelly <laughs> don't forget that emperor it's important so maybe there's a brokehead out there saying, hold on, guys. You guys always tell us that if it's selling, make more of it, print more of it, continue making it, keep selling it. Except when it's something we don't want, <laughs> <laughs> then they can't do that. Well, what's the difference? Why won't this work? Is it the timetable? Is it the fact that people aren't going to comic shops every single week? Is it the fact that DC is now forcing a budget on people and cutting down on those profits? So a little bit of all of that stuff. Another thing that's hurting them a lot, too, is DC's changing up things a lot, all the time. Some of these things are failing, so I won't say they need to give it a chance to kind of grow and to fall into a groove. But I'm kind of getting frustrated with them at this point because it was DCU. Now it's this. Now it's it. Now it's bi-weekly. Now, you know, just... I, I get you're trying to find your groove, but it's frustrating to me and especially with the bi-weekly like I said especially right after the holidays money's real tight I don't want to be thinking about having to buy twice as much as I already am with the DCU thing that still blows my mind that that did not work out because we I was a champion of that mm -hmm. DCU line I was this is going to be great it's going to be awesome they have some stuff for the new readers the younger readers and they have some stuff for the old readers what could go wrong? And I still don't know what the hell went wrong. I don't know if it was a marketing thing. I'm sure it was marketing. DC's terrible with their marketing. We talk about it all the time. They, they have so many opportunities to do just small things. They had that small one week. Small <laughs> things 
to to get these ideas out there and they just they don't take advantage of it and they need to hire a new marketing director or somebody who actually reads these books who can understand how to sell them to people because they don't have that they they aren't able to present these in a way where people go I have to have that they their default is put Harley on the cover pull Batman on the cover that's what makes people think they need it and that's what's making their money right now and and fortunately they have that but that's not always going to be the the Correct. golden they, you know they need to find a way to sell their other characters or sell their other books what was that aquaman was supposedly really good when the new 52 started yeah with jeff johns right never read it they didn't market it they didn't you know do a lot of things to get people interested in that book and say hey this is really good pick it up it's funny that you point that out because I read the first couple of trades and they were great. They were awesome, but I didn't stick with it because it wasn't something we were picking up on a monthly basis. And with the new creator, I think it was Cullen Bunn. I could be wrong. It was someone else. But a lot of readers started getting on his ass about the, the new book and how they hated him and bring back Jeff Johns. He left the book early and Jeff Johns is now back of writing Aquaman again. So it's funny you said that because it's like, oh, well, yeah, that author that was awesome at this is now back on it. So right. there you go. But again, are they marketing? Did I know that? I didn't know that. You didn't that. know that. That's true. If if Jeff Johns ever goes back to Green Lantern, they better make a huge fucking oh, deal yeah, of that. Oh, yeah, of course. Better do it. Because he, I hear this all the time, he single-handedly kept DC afloat with his Green Lantern mm -hmm. run before the New 52. And and I, I talked to my manager at... at at the comic shop I work at, and he said for a while there, Green Lantern was the only thing that was selling on the DC side as wow. far as like, this is profitable. Green Lantern is, right. is putting out good stories. And I told him, what was it? I mean, it's Green Lantern. He's, we all know now that it was an amazing run by Jeff Johns, and he said it was just a really good story. These were amazing arcs. He had it planned ahead of time, Jeff mm -hmm. Johns, like this is the arc I want to hit, and this is a plan. The Sinestro Corps War was its own amazing story, my favorite of the Green Lanterns, but it was just so that Sinestro can say, you can kill now. All the core, the entire core can kill. And that's why he did it. Because now it's a part of another story. And this mm -hmm. is coming up. Because now there's Green Lanterns that can murder. And then this continues. Do that shit with each of your lines. Do that. And drop any of the characters that would make a better cameo or, or whatever appearance. And then continue focusing on all of those. Cultivating those main characters. And have a plan. Have an author. Have a creative team that says, this is where we want to be. This is the story we're presenting. Let's get there. Help us with marketing, and let's get there. They should just hire us to, to be marketing. I would do it. If DC came to me tomorrow and they're like, hey, do you want to be marketing director? And they put enough zeros on that check, I would do it. <laughs> they, they would put two zeros on the check, and you'd be like, yeah, I'm going to do it. Yeah, okay. Because how great would that look on some resume? Warner Brothers? Uh... <laughs> okay, but I still have to be able to pay my bills. Oh, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> but to be fair, you wouldn't have to work super hard to try to be look, guys, put out more of this shit. Do what you know. Episode number one seventy. Whatever Dan said, take some of that, mix it in with this. <laughs> it's a cooking show now. <laughs> Bake for five. Oh wait, no, sorry, that's brownies. Um. <laughs> it's just frustrating, you know. It, mm -hmm. it seems like we're we're hating on DC, which many people are right now because Marvel has a cinematic universe and they're the popular ones. But it's the it's because we love these characters and DC is our favorite. That makes it so frustrating for Kelly and I because, and this isn't the first time we've done a rant like this, and that's kind of what sucks about it. And I and I hate that we don't know what we can point to and say, this is the person that's keeping this back, or or, you know, maybe it is the marketing, or maybe it's it's their creative team or editing team, whatever it may be. I have no idea, but it needs to change. Something mm -hmm. has to happen, and the biweekly books are not it. Nope. But hopefully, we'll see that change soon evidence of this is with our next bit and that is the diamond november 2015 bestsellers to anyone who's not familiar with diamond they are the distributors the main distributors to comic shops throughout the country so first we're going to start off with some comics we'll start with number five and go down to number one which was the bestseller first number five is extraordinary x-men then you have secret wars number seven deadpool number one Star Wars at Vader Down at number one. And finally, coming in in first place is Dark Knight 3, The Master Race, number one. So does that matter that you have one book in top five if the other four are from 
the opposite spectrum. No, it doesn't matter. You need more of your books there in the top five. If two of your books, two to three of your books are in the top five, you're in pretty good shape. Mm -hmm. One, and it's The Dark Knight 3, which is an event book and not a regular ongoing. Right. There's a problem there. Best selling of 2015, November. Awesome, but it's do more. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So heading on over to the graphic novel side of top selling November 2015 books, in number five is going to be Spider Gwen Volume Zero, which does include Edge of Spider Verse, which is the first appearance of Spider Gwen. So a lot of people got that and they're like, okay, mm -hmm. so this is zero, one through five. Number four is Miss Marvel, num Volume Four. Number three is Star Wars Princess Leia. At number two is Star Wars Journey to Star Wars The Force Awakens. No big surprise there <laughs> with the film coming out. Who came up with that title? That's actually the shortened title. It's it's Star Wars Journey to Star Wars The Force Awakens Shattered Empire. <laughs> I know it's fucking frustrating because when you try to file it, are you is it under Star Wars? Is it under Shattered Empire? Do I put it under Force Awakens? <laughs> it sucks. I'm very confused. And the number one best-selling graphic novel November 2015 is Sandman Overture, the deluxe, deluxe hardcover hard. Deluxe edition hardcover. <laughs> the deluxe hardcover hard edition hard cover. <laughs> Almost as frustrating as Journey into Star Wars Shattered but Empire not quite. Star Wars. <laughs> <laughs> so Sandman, did you expect that? I did not, but over good Star for Sandman. Over fucking Saga. Well, I don't... Who? <laughs> no, Saga is like number zero, which is like... The, Saga sold so many, it broke the internet's... And broke all the programs when they were typing this, so they couldn't even put that in. They were at, like, number nine. They probably. were at, like, number before one. <laughs> so, Sandman Overture, we've always said it's it's a great read when you when you have all the issues in front of you. And I know a lot of Brocats out there waited until they can get all the issues together before they read the story, which was very smart. And to anyone that does not collect individual issues, this is the ultimate edition of Sandman Overture. And it was a very good story, as, as we reviewed it was a great story, something that I would love to go through and read again as a whole. So like you said, very smart that they waited for this to come out. But the art was great. It, you know, like we said, the story was fantastic. And I'm glad it did really well. All right, so that was all the news for this week. It seemed like a couple of days ago, you checked the news outlets and just everything is gone. Everyone went on break. They, they went and enjoyed their vacation. They went out of the office. So we did not see a ton of news on that end, but thankfully we did have a lot of really good stuff on mm -hmm. the... A video game side especially tv shows and of course the performance of dc comics that we were able to discuss so before we move on to our two comic book highlights we do have some patreon news but first the shout out of the week this week's shout out goes to neil who is at in matt z 68 he is our Patreon shout out winner of the week. Is that a winner? Is that a prize? You get your shout out? Your That's winner a and a prize and a contributor and a donator and a hero to the podcast. Aha! Uh -huh. Podcast hero. Padero. Padero. <laughs> <laughs> I just love making up words. So thank you so much, Neil, mm -hmm. for your continued support for the Reasons I'm Broke podcast. You too can get your Patreon shout out of the week for as little as a dollar a month. You will get your shout out on the podcast and you also get the podcast a little bit early. Could be a couple of hours early, could be a couple of days early, but you will get a special email sent to you with a link to download the podcast. And we do have different tiers. The one Dan just mentioned is our $1 tier. Again, for $1 a month, you'll get your shout out. But if you say, guys, I want to help you out just a little bit more, we do have a $5 tier. And with that, not only do you get the podcast early and you get your shout out, but every three months you do get an exclusive decal, which we will post polls for to decide what that will be. And that comes from decalavenue.net. Yeah, exactly right. Think of it almost like a decal crate, if anything, <laughs> but but it's going towards the help of a podcast that you're helping to shape the future of as you go. And the uh, the next goal is actually back to the, the regular covering the expenses of the podcast that uploaded every single month. And that is because Patreon actually adjusted the way that they do the dollar amounts on the campaigns because they do take out a certain amount as their fee for hosting your, your Patreon account. So they said, okay, due to feedback, we're actually gonna post what the creators take home and can put towards 
their goals. So in our case, we had hit that $20 mark, but with the fees, we got down to about 17. So now it, it said, okay, well, you actually haven't reached the goal because based on fees, you don't have enough to cover this first goal. So we are uh, back towards the, not only the Alphonic quality for all of our episodes, but also just a few dollars away from having the podcast be a zero cost to put it up every single month. So huge thanks to all the broquettes that have helped us out thus far. And uh, also, I'm actually kind of glad that Patreon did a more accurate view because even your other favorite podcasts that you have out there or any other Patreon accounts that you have, you can now check on their stuff. And that is actually what will be going towards their project. We would like to preface, guys, that our podcast will always be free. We have so much fun doing this for you, interacting with you guys. So if you say, Ooh, stop trying to take my money, <laughs> <laughs> or if you say, I just can't afford it, that's fine. Uh, we just love that you enjoy listening to us. But one incentive that we would like to put out for our Patreon supporters is in the next few months, we will be having an exclusive Patreon episode. Pretty huge. This is a brand new thing, something we haven't done before, and not the last time we will do it. And this is a standalone episode that we will record and put out for the Brokeheads out there, for the Patreon supporters, and for the Brokeheads that have ever wanted to shape out an episode. If you've ever wanted to be heard on an episode, if you've ever wanted to say, you know what, these are the things I want you guys to talk about and cover, this is for you. So leading up to this episode, we will be taking your guys' questions, or like Daniel said, if you want to be on the podcast, you can send us a voice clip, and we would include that as well. And your question can be anything, well, almost anything, (laughs) but it doesn't have to be related to comics, movies, TV, video games, and more. If there's anything you've ever wanted to hear us talk about or any questions you've ever wanted to ask us as a Patreon supporter, you have that right. You can send us that question, and it will be answered on this exclusive podcast. Kelly, is there a minimum to the Patreon that they have to be at to be able to participate in the exclusive episode releasing, recording in February? One dollar. One dollar is the minimum. That's it. Whether it's a dollar or anything else. (laughs) Or five (laughs) hundred dollars. If you (laughs) support us with five hundred, you win our firstborn. (laughs) With five hundred, we'd be doing a second show immediately because that that would complete all of our goals up to this point. But for as little as a dollar, you can submit your questions, topics your voice clip with your questions and your topics or your thank yous or feedback, whatever it may be, to the reasons I broke at gmail.com. But that's only if you are a Patreon supporter. So once again, that website is patreon.com slash the reasons I'm broke. And you have plenty of time. You've got the end of December, all of January, couple probably a week or two into February to submit your topics, your questions, whatever it may be, your audio clips. The audio clips do have to be in MP3 or M4A format. All of the details are on that Patreon post. As soon as you donate donate to Patreon, you'll be able to see the exclusive creator posts for anyone that has supported the show. Then you can get all of the detail, details there. But to any Brocats, any listeners that are already a supporter, send on in those questions, whether it's through the Patreon account or through email, once again, the reasons I'm broke at gmail.com. If any of you Patreon supporters would like Daniel to talk about all the things he likes about me on this exclusive podcast, I would be okay with that. <laughs> that might be someone's going to submit that, that now. That should I bet be. You. <laughs> Somebody do that. And yeah, submit all of that stuff. We'll gather it all together and we'll create a special episode just for the patrons. So that being said, we are going to talk about two comics that we read this week. I'll just briefly touch on them. Um, The first is an indie, and the second is a DC book. Yeah, handpicked by Kelly. Yes. First one is Saga number 32, which is Forever Your Pick of the Week. Forever. Written by Brian K. Vaughn, art by Fiona Staples. And wasn't it still great? Yeah, it was good. Doesn't it deserve to be my pick of the week? It was very good. It was amazing. (laughs) So what would you like about it? Everything. (laughs) We get the reunion of two of our very beloved characters working towards a similar goal, working through their problems. As you remember, whoever reads this, uh, what was it, two issues ago, we took a pretty big time jump. Mm -hmm. And this, again, is in that same time jump. But you don't really feel lost. You get caught up very, very quickly with what's going on. And it's just it's a fun ride, and it's exciting. And I, I can never wait for the next one to come out. One of the heavier fallouts between the main couple in Saga 
happened three to four issues ago when both characters were at their weakest. Mm -hmm. And it was amazing to see that resolved in this. And not and not just in a way of, well, we're characters and we're just going to work it out. No, this is very human in the way that they're like, okay, we both fucked up and we're always, for, for the next, I don't know, maybe a couple of years, it's always going to be a thing. But for now, we both know that we're going to move past it, even if mm -hmm. it's going to be a bit of a struggle. I thought that was great. And that's yeah. just Brian K. Vaughn being like, here you go, guys. Fucking amazingness. Here's I a script. closed my eyes and threw letters on a page. You may think you're doing the artwork to this, but the art is right here in the words. <laughs> <laughs> Can he go right for DC? Because uh, I feel like they make more money. What would you put him on? What would you put on... What character do you want to see Brian K. Vaughn write? Oh, in DC? I wouldn't want him to do Batman. No, Scott Snyder's got a good thing going there. Yeah. Don't want Justice League because no. of Jeff Johns no. kicking ass with Dark Side yeah. War. Starfire no. and Harley are all Jimmy and Amanda's. No, don't don't want those. I, w I want... I need somebody who needs some emotion. Martian hmm. Manhunter's going to be canceled. <laughs> I guarantee you that. I mean, he'd be awesome on Martian Manhunter. I don't know. There's so many, so many possibilities. So you can't pinpoint it down. Your favorite author in the comic book world. You yeah, can't even. You are the head of the scene. You can't to, say, "Here you go, Brian K. Vaughn. You know, write this." I'd one. say, "Yo, Brian, what do you want to write? You can write whatever you want." Can I write Why the Last Man 2? That's fine. Go ahead. Do it. <laughs> so it's not even a, a, a DC superhero character. Yeah. It's just something vertigo. Just that's fine. You're going to make me money. It's cool. Anything this man decided to write would be amazing. He could just pick any character. Like, I think Swamp Thing would be really cool. He could do a lot with Swamp Thing. Yeah. I would even read his Constantine. I would read Brian K. Vaughn's Constantine in the comics. Even if it's not TV show Constantine? Yes. Even if it's comic book Constantine? Yes. But it'd have to be comic book Brian K. Vaughn Constantine. All right. <laughs> and then I would so read So if this it. ever happens, yes. you're definitely going to have to I'm buy every single read issue. All of them. And, and I will love them. And they will almost be my picks of the week. Except if they come out on the same week as Saga. <laughs> so Saga still trumps all. Yes. Just like if if Archie and Saga came out. Saga always trumps. Alright, so the other DC book. And that is the second one of the number one November bestseller. And that is The Dark Knight 3, The Master Race number 2. Written by Frank Miller and Brian Azzarello. Art by Andy Kubert. Colors by Brad Anderson. This was a really cool issue. I enjoyed this a lot. So the villains are going to be presented in this. Mm -hmm. You find out what the master race means after you, you, you read, read number two. We also know exactly what happened to Batman. All of that is answered here. What the future of that means. Is it answered? It is definitely answered. And I think Superman is starting to rumble inside. I think he's starting to be like, what is this something awakening within me? <laughs> He's like Nora. He can hear the world right now and he, he can it's like a dream for yes, him also. He just hears a heartbeat. And you just hear this like I can lift you up. Do, do. <laughs> like just this very muffled I can show you what you wanna see. <laughs> As he slowly I'm sure that's like, what he's ice hearing. crack <laughs> I'm sure that's what he's hearing. <laughs> so that that all happens in this. We also get some great Wonder Woman moments, too. Yeah, she, she the mini-comic with Wonder Woman mm -hmm. was really strong. It was awesome. So, so far, turning out to be a really good series. You can obviously tell that Brian Azzarello is controlling some of the crazy. Yeah. <laughs> There's definitely some Frank Miller stuff in here, but it, it's all, like, watered-down mm -hmm. Frank Miller things, which is good. It works in this. It's like, from ill. It's not Frank Miller. It's just from ill. It's from like ill. Half of him. <laughs> <laughs> So there you go. Those are the comic book highlights for the week. Mm -hmm. Your pick of the week being Saga number 32. We'll have way more news next week as the holiday breaks have come and gone. People get back in there, put out more stories, and we'll be there to give you our opinions and our thoughts on them. In the meantime, if you see anything that we you want covered on there again, just uh, shoot us an email at thereasonsimbroke at gmail.com. But otherwise, let us know what you thought of the episode this week on Twitter at Reasons I'm Broke. 
You can also listen to the podcast directly from our brand new standalone website, which is thereasonsimbroke.com. If you go to thereasonsimbroke.com, you will see a player on there which will work on your mobile device, on your tablet, and on your desktop. It's very simple, just the player right there. It's got links to all of the places you can find us, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, wherever you may think of. And there you go, another place you can bookmark and another place you can find us. Another thing for you guys to check out, if you head over to YouTube this past week, I did put up an unbagging Harley's Little Black Book variant for Harley Quinn number 23. There, did I get all that right? (laughs) You got it right. Still shorter than the Star Wars trade. Yes, (laughs) this is true. They just need to add more like Harley Quinn's in there. (laughs) Anyway, this is a Bruce Tim variant, which we were super, super excited for. Check out that video if you want to see what it looks like. Um, Also, last week on the podcast, we did talk about that. Did we talk about that comic book last week? No, we touched upon it. Yeah, yeah. we touched upon it very briefly. So if you want to hear about that, check out last week's podcast. Um, Otherwise, thank you guys so much for listening. We hope everyone had a very fun and safe holiday. As you go back out into the stores for the next week or so, be mindful of the people working. And just be aware, there will still be lines. So thank you guys so much for listening. I'm Kelly. And I'm Daniel. We'll see you on the next one.